G'day, my name is Jeff Brislane and I'm a professional real estate photographer from Sydney, Australia. I'm an AIPP accredited uh, photographer and I run my own business called Tempest Light Photography. Uh, I've been doing a, a series on real estate photography business coaching um, and I've recently done a video on uh, just the intro to the kind of camera gear you're going to need to be a real estate photographer. Now. Um, this is a follow-up to that video and I want to talk today just a little bit about the lenses I use and the kind of lenses that you're going to need to use to be um, to do professional real estate photography okay so first of all the, the first thing I want to get off the bat is um, is camera formats uh, obviously like there's three different camera formats main camera formats that people use that would be your full frame cameras your APS-C cameras and your micro four thirds um, equivalent cameras uh, I used uh, all full frame cameras. Uh, I use Canon and Nikon. Currently, I've got a D810, D750, 5D, and they're my primary workhorses for my real estate uh, work. Now, you don't have to necessarily jump straight into the full frame system to be a professional real estate photographer. You could also start out with APS-C camera systems, and I have used them in the past. Uh, I've used a Canon uh, EOS uh, 350D. Um, I even use a 20D way back in the day, which is kind of the equivalent of like an 80D these days. And uh, in those systems, I used uh, Canon APS-C wide-angle lenses, uh, and at the time it was a 10 to 22 millimeter lens, uh, which I use for those cameras. And you can get the equivalent cameras also for Nikon, Sony, whatever. All right, so but today I want to talk about the kind of lenses I use today, and these are the the lenses I recommend for anyone who's aspiring to get into professional real estate photography and, and wants to make a real business of it, a successful business of it. Okay, so the first kind of lens you want to look at is um, for a full frame system is kind of your basic 16 to 30, 16 to 35 range lens. And the lens I've got here is a 16 to 35 Canon, and that's a F4L lens. Um, and this is an um, incredibly good lens. Okay, I used to own a 17 to 40 mil Canon lens, which was sharp, and it was a very sharp lens um, in the center and in a couple of the corners. But in two of the corners, it was as blurry as heck. Um, and that was just one of those things about the 17 to 40 mil. It was tack sharp in the center, but around the edges, it stretched and blurred quite a bit. Um, when they released the 16 to 35, they Got good reviews. Um, I bought one, used it, loved it. Sold the 17 to 40. Haven't looked back. So this is a great lens. The corner to corner sharpness is excellent, um, and it has the kind of focal range you need. So 16 to 35 is that nice wide focal range that you're going to be using a lot uh, shooting real estate properties. Now the wide angles, 16 is pretty good. Um, I'm a bit sport now, uh, I mostly use my Nikon, so I'm using a 14 to 24, and I'll show you that lens, that's this lens here. That's the, the Nikon 14 to 24, f2.8. Um, and this is a, a beautiful lens. Very sharp, sharp edge to edge. Um, it's got more distortion than the Canon 16 to 35, um, but the distortion is easily corrected in Photoshop, and uh, it's a, it renders a beautiful image. It, like I said, edge to edge sharpness is perfect. Now, this is, this is just really not that necessary first up. The Nikon also makes the 16 to 35 as well, uh, F4, which is a great lens. I don't personally own it because uh, I just was gonna use this one. So when I uh, got my D750 and my D810, I just went straight to the 14 to 24. Um, it, uh, you know, it, was, it didn't seem at the time to be, you know, to any, any need to buy two lenses in a very similar focal range. So I just opted for the 14 to 24 because I knew it was the sharper of the two lenses, probably the better of the two lenses. The, the downside to this lens, and this is the downside to some of the uh, full frame lenses, is the 14 to 24 is massive. It's a it's a huge lens. It's got a massive bulbous front element. You see that? So you can't put filters on that. Well, you can. There are filter companies that make adapters for that. I don't use filters for them. Um, in my in my work, but I do find that you you have to watch that with lens flare. Uh, the 16 to 35 is much better. Comes with a nice little pedal hood, which does protect fairly well from lens flares. And this lens deals with flares very well. I found the 16 to 35 Canon F4 is an excellent lens 
for dealing with flares. It deals with the flare better than this. Okay, so the Nik Nikon's probably behind the can in that regard. Um, and even the, the modern Tamron 15 to 30, which I love, I, I think it's a beautiful lens and I've used it, I don't own it. Uh, that deals with flare better than the, uh, the Nikon as well. So they're kind of the two kind of lenses you want to be looking at. Um, whether it's the 16 to 35 range or even the 14 to 24, and in the, in the Canon you can get the, I think it's 11 to 22, um, which is a super wide. But you just got to watch the wide angles. You just got to watch how how often you use them. Um, as always with real estate photography, you, you're trying to show the house in the correct proportions, the correct dimensions. Um, there is that temptation to always go wide and to make everything look big and spacious. But it gets deceptive, and um, I don't know about other countries, but I do know in Australia there is legislation about using real estate photography that is deceptive, and you can get in trouble for it. So um, using, a, say, a Canon 11 to 22 and, and, and always having 11 millimeters making rooms look massive, um, that could get you in a spot of trouble. Um, so I find with my 14 to 24 in daily use, I'm often around 16 to 18 to 20 millimeter range. I take a lot of shots in that range. What I find is if I'm in a, in a tight room, I'll start at 16, so I'll set my lens on 16 mil to start with, and then see if I can get the room in 16, get all the features in 16. If I have to go a bit wider, you know, I'll creep out to 15. Very rarely do I go right out to 14. I honestly don't often go out to 14. Um, I try not to as much as possible. I'll pull the camera back, even out of a doorway, as much as I possibly can to try and get a better, uh, more natural perspective and not to stretch things. Cause you gotta watch anything near the edge of your frame is gonna be absolutely stretched with a lens like this. And it's one of the things you downsize. You really have to watch for that when you're using these lenses. All right, so recommendations. Obviously these are great lenses. They're very expensive. I, I, under, I fully understand when people are coming from a different field and they're not, uh, you know, they don't have professional camera gear. This is, this seems like a huge jump. But, you know, this makes money. This makes you money. It's like a nail gun for a carpenter. You know, a carpenter will spend two and a half thousand dollars on a pair of nail guns. You know, that he'll, you know, the gas powered ones that he'll he'll put houses together with. And that makes him money every day. This thing was, you know, it's two and a half thousand Australian dollars. This makes me money every single day. Um, and I do not have a problem spending that much money on a lens which is gonna make me a daily income. Absolutely not. In saying that, this one is much cheaper. This was sixteen hundred dollars uh, Australian, which is a, a much cheaper lens, and it's still a great lens. Look, honestly, you can get away with a lens like this, no problem at all. And even the ten to twenty-two Canon on an APS-C sensor, uh, those lenses are, are again a little bit cheaper again. And look, they're great lenses. Uh, again, just watch your wide angles. Make sure you don't go wide all the time, and um, and watch the perspective of things. But yeah, look, this is it's, it's known. You don't have to go all out on a lens like this. You don't have to. I chose to. Um, like I said, I chose between this and the 16 to 35, and I thought, well, I'm just going to go straight to the 14 to 24 because it's the sharper of the two. Even though it has a bit more distortion, it's the sharper of the two, and it's just a, you know, why have both? So that's kind of the way I went. Um, now, another lens which people probably don't think of very often, which is I have in my kit all the time, and which I do use from time to time, not every day. It's this one, it's a uh, 70 to 200 f4. This is a Nikon version, it has VR. This is a great lens. Uh, I love this lens, so sharp. This is a, such a sharp lens. Oh, so good. Now, what I use this for is you know, very rarely, but I do get jobs from time to time where I'm asked to shoot a view, a uh, view shot. Um, there's a particular agent in my area I work for uh, in the mountains behind Sydney and they often have properties with views and they'll ask me for a view shot can you because you can often see the city from up there and i take this with me and i can get some nice compressed view shots that show the view nice and compressed you know and and just concentrate on the view without being too wide and picking up all that extra detail you don't want and also these these are great for doing location shots so if you're uh shooting some real estate in an area and the agent wants location shots you know people and places a uh, 70 to 200 is a great lens for that. You just walk around town, get some location shots, shoot people going about their business in shops, you know, prominent shops and things like that uh, to help sell the, the area, at, you know, for the real estate agent. So that's that's one lens that people probably don't think very often, but I do have that in my kit. And 
the next lens I want to show you is this one. Now this is an architectural lens. This is no, this is this is not necessary for starting out as a real a real estate photographer. Okay, so this is the twenty four millimeter tilt shift. This is a uh, the Nikon version. Okay, so it's a f. Is it f four? Sorry, three point five. Yeah, this is f three point five. Um, and this is a great lens. Now, like I said, you don't you don't necessarily need this when you're starting out in real estate photography. Um, and when I did, I didn't have one. When I started, I didn't have one of these. I bought this one two and a half years ago, uh, brand new. And I purchased it because I often find myself in situations where I'm shooting a house from uh, above or below. And I don't like tilting, obviously, when you when you tilt your camera up or down, you know you, your vertical start to converge, and you get your house start to either lean in or lean out, and it just it looks wrong. Okay, so what I used to do was I get my fourteen to twenty four or my sixteen to thirty five, and I would shoot wide. So I go forty mil, shoot really wide, and then I'll crop the house. So I go really nice big wide shot, so I can get the house straight up and down, and then I'll just crop out that section where the house was. Okay, so you end up with a smaller shot. Often you know. One, one third the original size of the image so you, you know if you had 24 megapixels you end up with probably an 8 10 megapixel shot in the end where you've just cropped out the house but that's how i would do it what this allows me to do um, is get the same image but this time uh, it's the full megapixel count of my camera that's producing the image and this is so sharp this lens is a beautiful beautiful sharp lens it has it's just a really good ren rendering lens um, and yeah, so if I'm sitting on a driveway and the house is right below me, which happened to me just recently, um, I, tilt, I shift this down and bring the house in full view, beautiful. All my verticals are straight up and down. I've got a, uh, a photo which is just full of the house with no extraneous details. I don't have to do any cropping and it it's excellent sharpness as well. Also recently did a video on uh, shooting the exterior of a, um, an apartment block in a ski resort. Uh, again, the building was much higher than me, and this time it was a four-story building on top of a large car park on top of a hill. So shooting those kind of uh, large apartment buildings, this, very handy, all right? So you can get the whole apartment building in, even if you're close to it, and oftentimes you have to be close. Oftentimes you can't step out into a road. I'll shoot an apartment block sometimes where, um, you know, there's a busy four-lane road. You, don't wanna, you can't go out in the road, you get run over. So if you go on the other side of the road, you're gonna start picking up parked cars on the street, things like that, you don't want that. So, you know, being able to shift up and get the whole building in uh, to a full resolution shot is often good. But again, it's not necessary. You don't have to have uh, any tilt shift lens when you start out, okay? And I mean, Nikon now makes a 19, Canon makes a 17 mil tilt shift, and there's a temptation to get this nice big wide tilt shift lens. They're great lenses, but again, you don't need the, the tilt shift thing to begin with. It's perfectly, you're perfectly capable, you know, fine to crop an image out, make sure you know you get, you get your vertical straight, go really wide, and then crop into the house later on. And that's a perfectly viable option. I mean, you think about real estate photography, most real estate agents are publishing almost all their stuff on the internet. Um, there's still a few that do brochures and printouts of photos, but not that many these days. Most of them are just fully, completely on the internet. So, they don't really have much use for large files, to be honest. And that's also where like a smaller 20 megapixel APS-C size camera is still fine. I mean, those cameras are fine. When I first started shooting, I was shooting an eight megapixel Canon. So an eight megapixels back then was fine. All right. Now there are other options. Um, so if you're going from uh, your full frame sensors and you're not using your 16 to 35s or your 11 to 24s or your 14 to 24s, um, or your tilt shift lenses. If you're in a APS-C system, like a Sony system, uh, or uh, Sony, Panasonic, that kind of system. So not Nikon or Canon, because Nikon or Canon have their own uh, range of excellent um, APS-C lenses. So Nikon's their DX lenses, and the Canon are the, you know, your 11, your 10 to 22s, and your 18 to 55. You know, those kind of the uh, APS-C lenses. They're great. But if you're in the Sony world. And the, and the other in those other worlds that are uh, like uh, Panasonic and things, then um, there's a whole bunch of third party lenses or lens companies that make like really compact wide angle mirrorless lenses that are you know 
uh, if I get this one off, designed for those cameras. And what I have here is I've got a, this is a fairly popular one. This is a, a Samyang or a Rockingon. It's a cheap lens. It's fairly cheap. It was about $400 Australian, which is fairly cheap. Um, and this is a 12 millimeter lens. Uh, it's an F2. Or this one's actually a T2.2. I bought the signed version of the lens instead of the, the uh, actual camera version because I wanted the de-clicked aperture for shooting some video work and for doing um, uh, time lapse. Now, this is a this is a great lens. It has its limitations though. And the limitations of this lens is, number one, um, distortion. Okay, Probably the biggest limitation is distortion and chromatic aberration. They're the two biggest limitations of this lens. You get what you pay for, okay? The chromatic aberration on this lens is terrible, really bad. Um, and the distortion on this lens is atrocious. Now, I don't know if it's just lens to lens, uh, the, the distortion changes, or if they're all you know, as bad as the one I own, but this is really bad. The distortion on this, it's like a really complex type of distortion. You can't just uh, push the center out because it's its kind of wavy. It's got like a wavy distortion that runs through it. And without a profile, and there's no profile for this on um, Camera Raw, so without a profile, it's really hard to fix these images to get the distortion out when you want straight lines. It just, it just doesn't happen. And straight lines are critical. For real estate and architectural work, you want straight lines. That's why you want your, your 16 to 35 mils, your good professional kind of lenses, these things, I mean, they, they still have distortion, but it's it's a simple, more simple distortion. And there's profiles for it that can completely remove that distortion in camera roll. Uh, this lens, unfortunately, doesn't. So I don't use this lens ever for wide-angle photography because it's really not that good for wide-angle photography, okay? What I use this lens for is for gimbal work, um, shooting uh, uh, 1080 video with my A6000, okay? So this gives me a nice wide-angle um, uh, option for my A6000. I think this is a 18 millimeter equivalent. So it's a nice, fairly wide angle lens, um, and I've got a declipped aperture, so I can I can use this uh, shooting video, get nice, smooth control of lighting. And I never really use this for architectural work, but I do know some people recommend these lenses on the internet um, as if these lenses are a great option for real estate. And look, honestly, they're just not. They're really not. You're better off getting yourself uh, Canon Nikon equivalents, the uh, like the 10 to 22 on the Canon side. The Nikon's got a really cheap one now. I think it's um, 12 to 20 something. I don't know, but you you know what I'm you know, you know what I'm talking about. So they're they they're, they're kind of that APS-C wide angle zoom uh, for both Canon and Nikon. They're great. Um, Sony has their own native lens. The um, is it 10 to I think it's 10 to 18, which again is a good lens. But it's not perfect, and this is this is a, probably the last thing I want to talk about, um, and that's why this is why the Sony one's not the best. Now this lens here, um, it does have your your focal markings, okay, across the top there. It's um, quite clear. It's very tight though. You will also notice, you know, your Canons have in here. You can actually see. If I get that a bit closer, you can actually see you get your focal markings, okay? Nikon's the same. Alright, so your Canon Nikons, they, they're all the same. They're manual zoom lenses, manual focus lenses, or autofocus, sorry, autofocus lenses, but I always shoot the manual, um, and manual zoom lenses. The problem with the Sony's is that the power zoom. Sony lenses all have power zoom, and that power zoom, it's not, they don't all have power zoom, do they? No. No, the one I've got's got power zoom. The problem with Sony's is they don't have your your lens markings, and they they do have power zoom. I think they do. I'm not hundred. Look, the Sony's are they're a bit of a mystery to me. Honestly, those lenses are a bit of a mystery because um, I know that they don't have they're not, they're fully electronic. I mean, Nikon's semi electronic, Canon are fully electronic, but Canon still has full control over aperture and focus stuff like that. Okay. Um, but with the Sony 10 to 18, I do know that it's very hard to get repeatable focus. And with your Sony camera, you're adjusting your manual focus with the camera itself. You like you on your screen or your camera, you're going in your settings and you're adjusting your focus to whatever mood is you want from there. I just don't like that for real estate photography. That's just not the way to go at all. You don't want to be doing that um, 
with real estate or architectural photography because you're just not going to get a, a clean, repeatable focus um, with your cameras. You're just not. Okay. I like to see the focus dials, the, the markings on there, so I can change my focus to infinity, one meter, one and a half minutes, two minutes, whatever. Okay. But it's accurate and I can get it in a, in a split second. I can just quickly adjust my ring, shoot. All right. With Sony, you're digging into the menu, going to your manual focus, adjusting your manual focus, one meter, five meters, 10 meters, infinity, 20 meters, infinity. It, it, it's a wasting your time. Honestly, it's so fiddly to use manual focus on a Sony camera like that. It drives me up the wall. It's really, really hard. And I've got, I'll just grab the, the camera. Yeah, the Sony A6000, and it's got the standard, the standard lens on it, so this came with the camera body. It's a great little lens, by the way. If you're shooting just, you know, family events, things like that, this is, this is a great little camera. But again, it's got, it is, this, is, this one is fully power zoom on the lens, but there's nothing. There's no lens markings. The way to, to be able to get your focus with the Sony, it, unfortunately, is to dig into your, to your function manual and you go to your focus, you change it to manual and then you adjust your manual focus until you get it right. And it's, no, it doesn't work, okay? It's great for consumer cameras like this, sure, because in a consumer camera like this, Sony's assuming that everyone is just shooting autofocus and probably auto exposure most of the time with these cameras. You know, and that's fine. So manual focus on a camera like this is a bit of an afterthought. These, on the other hand, these are professional lenses. Professional lenses. These are designed for people to be able to quickly and accurately focus, zoom, and get their aperture. Even a lot of Nikon lenses still have the aperture rings on them to be able to control your, your shot quickly, accurately, repeatedly. Shot after shot, it gets out of your way, okay? So you're not digging through menus to focus. And that's probably the biggest drawback to using these cameras, and that's why I have never personally embraced these little compact mirrorless cameras for real estate work. I mean, until they can, until someone starts making great manual lenses for these where you can adjust, focus, zoom, repeatedly, accurately, mecha almost mechanically on the lens itself and not through the body, I'm, never, I'm not gonna use these. They're just, they're not good for the job we do for, the, for real estate photography. They're just not good for that. So if you are thinking about trying to save a bit of money and go for a system like this, I advise absolutely not. They have their uses, but real estate photography is just not one of them. Really not. Not for, I mean, there'll be someone out there who does. Look, trust me, there'll be some real estate photographer out there who probably uses this or a micro four thirds with their lens and said, oh, it works perfectly. I just get autofocus. I autofocus on this and I autofocus on that chair or on that thing there and it all comes out good. Ah, I don't do that at all. Honestly, when I walk into a job, right? I get my focus, this is my Canon 16 and 35. I put my focus on one particular spot. It's a bit between one and infinity, probably about, sorry, it's having trouble focusing, but probably about there, okay? And then pretty much every room in the house, I'll shoot and not change the focus. The only time I'll change it is if I go into a bathroom that's really small and I'll focus a bit closer, maybe down to one meter. So the shower and anything that's close to the lens will be in focus. And the only other time I change is when I go outside, I go closer to infinity to get the outside. Because obviously now the house is probably 10 meters from you or more, and you're shooting more into an infinity focus now, okay? So I set the focus pretty much once for most rooms of a house, all right? I don't really want to fiddle around with that in here, and I don't trust the focus in these things. I don't, I don't think it's that uh, accurate and I've never really gotten into that. It's just so much quicker to just go beep on your lens, done. So when I'm setting up my camera, sure, this gets bumped all the time, I set up my camera, quickly adjust that, adjust my zoom, adjust my shutter, look at it, look, look, shoot a photo, done, okay? Lastly, very lastly, two other lenses I, I quickly wanna talk about. This is, again, this is, these lenses aren't compulsory, I've just uh, gotten these over time, and I do take these on shoots with me. Now, occasionally I get asked to do detail shots um, or interesting shots in properties 
to try and get a feel of the property, not just show the spaces of a house, but to get kind of the feel of the house itself. And oftentimes, in a really beautiful home, um, it's been decorated well, and it's got beautiful furniture, beautiful appliances. It has you, you can get like a really nice homely feel, or a, you know, entertaining feel. Like this house just feels warm and welcoming. And oftentimes, uh, manager go, "Oh, this house is beautiful. Can you somehow capture that?" And I'll find some decor, some furniture that kind of capture captures that uh, feeling. And I'll shoot that. Now, sometimes I'll shoot it with the 424 at 24 mil at f 2.8. Oftentimes, though. I'll grab my 50 mil, or I also carry, believe it or not, a 35 mil. So that's a 35 Nikol 35 1.8G, and that's the 50 millimeter 1.8G. All right, so they're both 1.8G lenses, 35 and 50, and I'll use either of these lenses to you know, capture the feel. So I'll go and probably f2, f1.8, f2, um, and shoot some nice shallow depth of field. Maybe pick up a nice uh, picture on the wall with uh, some furniture in that behind it kind of blurring out nicely with some beautiful light coming through a window just to capture like the feel of the property um, and again these aren't compulsory honestly not you know and if I didn't have these two I could, I could be able to do everything I just said with the 14 to 24 because it's an f2.8 lens so I could put this on 24 mil and shoot at f2.8 and you know what if, if I wanted to go more narrow I would just take my d750 and I'll put it in dx mode dx crop mode so then I'm shooting at, uh, hang on, I've got to do some maths now, roughly 35 mil at f2.8, DX crop mode, and you can get kind of a very, very similar feel to that lens. But I own this lens now, it's light as a feather. I mean, honestly, these two lenses are so light, I chuck them in my bag, and together, they're lighter than my 16 to 35 Canon. So they, and they don't take up much space at all. Um, and it's just nice to, have, nice to have that option. And the other benefit of having a, a 35 and a 50 in your lens bag is rarely, but every now and then, I get an agent saying, can you take a photo of me or the agent? So I'm on a job shoot the property and the agent says, oh, I, I need a new photo for a business card or website, Facebook. Uh, can you shoot that? Can you do that now? We'll just do it in the backyard. There's a nice you know, backyard. Can I get a photo here now? Can I do that today? No worries, mate. I've got my 50 mil lens if they want a full body portrait. I've got a 35 if I want to go a bit more in head and shoulders. I've also got my my 70 to 200 in the bag, uh, so I can step back a bit and come in at 200 mil and get a nice compressed headshot. So you don't get compressed very often, but sometimes I do. Now I, I never used to carry those lenses in the past, and I would have just used that lens honestly to shoot a portrait at 35 mil. Um, not as good, but you know. You can always crop crop in afterwards um, but over time I've just collected those lenses you know and you know after a while you'll find after a while in business in photography you just tend to collect lenses you find um, you know you got to spend money and you think I've always wanted a 35 always wanted a 50 I get asked every now and then to do a headshot and I don't like using the 16 to 35 I'll buy 50 mil and so you do you buy 50 mil or you buy 100 mil macro or you buy, you know, your 70 to 200, because every now and then you do get asked to do a few location shots and you want to take a nice shot of the local area, but you don't want to go on really close and freak people out. Maybe you want to step back a bit, give people space that they don't think you, if they're being photographed so you can get people more naturally and just get some nice local um, shots for your real estate agent as well. So that's probably, a, um, and it's a fairly comprehensive look into the kind of lenses I use. These are the lenses I use, so these are all mine. Um, I use these lenses all the time, um, like I said, mostly the 14 and 24 these days, um, and the, the tilt shift I use from time to time actually more often than the 70 to 200. Uh, the Canon one's pretty much a backup one these days, although I love, I just can't sell it. I love this lens, it's such a beautiful, beautiful lens, I can't, I can't sell it. I've still got my 5D Mark II, which I haven't sold. Maybe I'll sell that one day and buy a better Canon, maybe a 5D SR or something, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but these are the lenses I use every day, and... Um, I swear by these now, but when you're starting out, when you're starting out, you know, you can get away with APS-C, Canon, Nikon, um, get your, uh, you know, your 10 to 20, 10 to 22 kind of lens range. That's perfectly, it's perfectly fine to start out in that position. You don't have to go drop straight into full frame. But if, you, if you're serious, these things make you money. Y y your lens is going to make you money. This, this makes me money every every single week. I'm shooting jobs every single week with this lens constantly. It's a money maker. Why wouldn't I just go out, um, get the system which is going to do the job the best, the most versatile lens, which is this one for me, 
and just run with it, you know? Pay the money up front, get the equipment, spend it once. A 14 to 24 is a lifetime lens. Honestly, this is a lifetime lens. It's the kind of lens you'll never sell. Um, I haven't yet, but I'll, I'll, I wanna do some astrophotography with this. I can shoot landscapes with this. It's a very versatile lens. Beautiful, sharp, versatile, and it's a one purchase lens. You know, you purchase it once, and it's such a great lens, it lasts your lifetime. Um, never have to, um, if I drop it, I'll have to replace it, but hopefully, never have to replace it. So, when you think like that, it makes sense to kind of spend a bit more money and go into a better lens. But look, if you can't, you can't, and it's fine. You know, it's fine, you can start out in the beginning. So anyway, that's just some uh, advice uh, and a look into what I use in my camera bag to shoot real estate uh, day to day on a weekly basis. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, and if you wanna check out some other videos, go ahead. If you wanna comment and uh, ask me any questions about lens, go ahead, I'll be happy to help you out as much as I can. But apart from that, I'm out. Catch you later.